If you live on the West Coast, and you may have been working when uh, Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich delivered his remarks, which would have been at 5 o'clock e West Coast time, and so we will re-air throughout the evening the events of the day, including the Speaker's remarks, uh, which took place from S230 in the uh, U.S. Capitol, the Speaker's office, and we'll follow that at 11.30 Eastern time, 8.30 for those of you in the West Coast, with the Democratic response by Congressman Dick Gephardt and Senator Daschle of South Dakota, and then another chance for you to phone in with your comments during an open phone segment for about 20 minutes. And then at midnight here in the East Coast, 9 o'clock West Coast time, we will show you the President's remarks from Dallas, Texas, at the American Society of Newspaper Editors Association as he spoke to them and took some questions from the newspaper editors. But first, the Speaker of the House earlier this evening here in Washington. Good evening. I want to thank you for joining me tonight and for this chance to give you, the American people, a report on the new Congress, what we've been doing, what we hope to do, and how we're working to keep faith with what you sent us here to do. But first, let me thank the hundreds of thousands of Americans who've written me over the past few months. Your letters, nearly 400,000, are full of good ideas and often moving words of encouragement. This letter, addressed to Dear Mr. Newt, included a portrait of George Washington. It was sent to me by first grader Stephen Koviak from Georgia. And I thank Stephen and everyone else who wrote me, even if you didn't include a picture of George Washington. Last September, the House Republicans signed a contract with America. We signed this contract and made some promises to you and to ourselves. You elected us, and for the last 93 days, we have been keeping our word. With your help, we're bringing about real change. We made Congress subject to the same laws as everyone else. We cut congressional committee staffs and budgets by 30%, and we voted on every item in the contract. And I can tell you tonight, we're going to sell one congressional building and privatize at least one congressional parking lot. While we've done a lot, this contract has never been about curing all the ills of the nation. 100 days can't overturn the ne neglect of decades. The contract's purpose has been to show that change is possible. That even in Washington, you can do what you say you're going to do. In short, we wanted to prove to you, and I think to us, that democracy still has the vitality and the will to do something about the problems facing our nation. And it seems to me that whether you're a conservative or a liberal, that is a very positive thing. And so I want to talk about the contract tonight, our successes and our failures, but I also want to talk about something much larger. Because although I've spent the last six months of my life living and breathing and fighting for what's written in this contract, I know the American people want more than these 10 items. So what I want to talk with you about tonight is not just what a new political majority on Capitol Hill has accomplished in 100 days, but how all of us together, Republicans and Democrats alike, must totally remake the federal government to change the very way it thinks, the way it does business, the way it treats its citizens. After all, the purpose of changing government is to improve the lives of our citizens, to strengthen the future of our children, to make our neighborhoods safe, and to build a better country. Government is not the end. It is the means. We Americans wake up every morning, go to work, take our kids to school, fix dinner, do all the things we expect of ourselves, and yet something isn't quite right. There's no confidence that government understands the values and realities of our lives. The government is out of touch and out of control. It is in need of deep and deliberate change. Now, when that change is accomplished, then perhaps Americans will be able to sleep a little better at night and wake up feeling less anxious about their futures. I represented the people who worked at the Ford plant in Hapeville, Georgia. The Ford Motor Company, like all the domestic auto industry, faced the need to change in order to keep up with tougher competition. Today, they produce twice as many cars per employee at three times the quality. And General Motors and Chrysler are doing the very same thing. So are America's small businesses. They're all rethinking the way they operate. Should government be any different? Of course not. We sincerely believe we can reduce spending and at the same time make government better. You know, virtually every institution in America, except government, has re-engineered itself to become more efficient over the last decade. They cut spending, 
provided better products, better education, and better service for less. But I believe we must remake government for reasons much larger than saving money or improving services. The fact is, no civilization can survive with 12-year-olds having babies, with 15-year-olds killing each other, with 17-year-olds dying of AIDS, with 18-year-olds getting diplomas they can't even read. Every night, on every local news, we see the human tragedies that have grown out of the current welfare state. And as a father of two daughters, I can't ignore the terror and worry parents in our inner cities must feel for their children. Within a half mile of this capital, your capital, drugs, violence, and despair threaten the lives of our citizens. We cannot ignore our fellow Americans in such desperate straits by thinking that huge amounts of tax dollars release us from our moral responsibility to help these parents and their children. There is no reason the federal government must keep an allegiance to failure. You know, with goodwill, with common sense, with the courage to change, we can do better for all Americans. Another fact we cannot turn our head away from is this. No truly moral civilization would burden its children with the economic excesses of the parents and grandparents. Now this talk of burdening future generations is not just rhetoric. We're talking about hard economic consequences that will limit our children and grandchildren's standard of living. Yet that is what we are doing for the children trapped in poverty, for the children whose futures are trapped by a government debt they're going to have to pay. We have an obligation tonight to talk about the legacy we are leaving our children and our grandchildren an obligation to talk about the deliberate remaking of our government. This change will not be accomplished in the next hundred days. But we must start by recognizing the moral and economic failure of the current methods of government. In these last 100 days, we have begun to change those failed methods. We outlined 10 major proposals in the contract that will begin to break the logjam of the past. The House passed 9 out of 10. First, we passed the Shays Act which makes the Congress obey all the laws that other Americans have to obey. The House passed it, the Senate passed it, and the President signed it. So that's one law signed, sealed, and delivered. We passed a balanced budget amendment in the House with bipartisan support. It has been temporarily defeated in the Senate by one vote. Although constitutional amendments are harder to get through Congress because they require two-thirds vote rather than a simple majority, don't be discouraged. Senator Dole has said he will call it up for another vote. The momentum is with us, and with your help and your voice, I believe it is possible this amendment will pass later in this Congress. As promised, we introduced a constitutional amendment on term limits, but we failed, even though 85% of House Republicans voted for it. Again, that two-thirds vote. There have been 180 bills introduced to limit congressional terms over America's history but not one of them ever made it to the House floor until last week when we brought term limits to a vote. I pledge to you that term limits will be the first vote of the next Congress. So keep the pressure on. Keep your hopes up. In both the House and the Senate, we passed a line item veto, just as you asked. It's remarkable that a Republican House and a Republican Senate are giving such a strong tool to the President of the other party. I believe it shows our good faith determination to cut spending. Other contract proposals have passed the House and are being worked on in the Senate. We passed regulatory reform, legal reform, and welfare reform. We passed a $500 tax credit per child. We passed an increase in the earning limit for senior citizens so they won't have their Social Security checks cut if they earn extra money. We passed a capital gains tax cut and indexed those gains to spur the savings and investment that creates jobs. Even with all these successes and others, the contract with America is only a beginning. It is the preliminary skirmish to the big battles yet to come. The big battles will deal with how we remake the government of the United States. The measure of everything we do will be whether we are creating a better future with more opportunities for our children. New ideas, new ways, and old-fashioned common sense can improve government while reducing its costs. Let me give you an example. The United States government 
is the largest purchaser of vacuum tubes in the Western world. This is a Federal Aviation Administration tube based on good, solid 1895 technology. This is actually the updated mid-1950s version. When you fly in America, vacuum tubes in the air traffic control system keep you safe. Our purchasing rules are so complicated and so wasteful that our government has not been able in seven years to figure out how to replace vacuum tubes with this. This is a microchip. It has the computing power of three million vacuum tubes. So today's government operates this way. After we remake it, the government of the future will operate this way. My point is this. The same reliance on the obsolete pervades most of the federal government, not just in regard to computers, but in regard to its thinking, its attitudes, its approaches to problems. It's one thing if we're talking about vacuum tubes, but this backward thinking is entirely something else if we're talking about human lives. The purpose of all this change is not simply a better government. It is a better America. A truly compassionate government would replace the welfare state with opportunity because the welfare system's greatest cost is the human cost to the poor. In the name of compassion, we have funded a system that is cruel and destroys families. Its failure is reflected by the violence, brutality, child abuse, and drug addiction in every local TV news broadcast. Poor Americans are trapped in unsafe government housing, saddled with rules that are anti-work, anti-family, and anti-property. Let me give you some statistics on this failure. Welfare spending now exceeds $300 billion a year. Yet despite all the trillions that have been spent since 1970, the number of children in poverty has increased 40%. On this chart, you'll notice that welfare spending goes up, and so does children born outside marriage. Year by year, they track each other. The more tax money we spend on welfare, the more children who are born without benefit of family and without strong bonds of love and nurturing. If money alone were the answer, this would be a paradise. But since money is not the answer, it should be clear we have a moral imperative to remake the welfare system so every American can lead a full life. After all, we believe that all men and all women are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We are determined to remake this government until every child of every racial background in every neighborhood in America knows that he or she has all the opportunities of an American. I believe we have to do a number of things to become an opportunity society. We must restore freedom by ending bureaucratic micromanagement here in Washington. As any good business leader will tell you, decisions should be made as closely as possible to the source of the problem. This country is too big and too diverse for Washington to have the knowledge to make the right decision on local matters. We've got to return power back to you, to your families, your neighborhoods, your local and state governments. We need to promote economic growth by reducing regulation, reducing taxation, and reducing frivolous lawsuits. And everywhere I go, Americans complain about an overly complicated tax code and an arrogant, unpredictable, and unfair internal revenue service. This summer, we will begin hearings on bold, decisive reform of the income tax system. We're looking at a simplified flat tax and other ways to bring some sense to the disorder and inequity of our tax system. You know, another reason for optimism is the tremendous opportunities being created by the new information technologies. Tre tremendous is a big word. So let me show you an example. This is a traditional telephone cable. This, I hope you can see it, it's pretty small, is a fiber optic cable. You can barely see it. This almost invisible fiber optic cable, with some pride I can tell you it's made in uh, Norcross, Georgia, is equal to not one of these, to 64 of these big, bulky, traditional cables. Now that is a tremendous opportunity. With these breakthroughs, the most rural parts of America can be connected electronically to the best learning, the best healthcare, and the best work opportunities in the world. Distance learning can offer new hope 
to the present inner city neighborhood, the poorest Indian reservation, and the smallest rural community. Distance medicine can bring the best specialists in the world to your health clinic and your hospital. Furthermore, the breakthroughs in molecular medicine may cure Alzheimer's, eliminate many genetic defects, and offer new cures for diabetes, for cancer, and for heart disease. These breakthroughs, combined with preventive care and medical innovations, can create better health care for all Americans. And we will pass a reform so that when you change jobs, you can't be denied insurance, even if you or your family have health problems. We will improve Medicare by offering a series of new Medicare options that will increase senior citizens' control over their own health care and guarantee them access to the best and most modern systems of health research and health innovation. My father, my mother, and my mother-in-law all rely on Medicare. I know how crucial the Medicare system is to senior Americans, and we will ensure that it continues to provide the care our seniors need with more choices at less cost to the elderly. All around us, opportunities for a better life are being developed, but our government all too often ignores or even blocks them. We need those breakthroughs which create new jobs, new health, and new learning. They give us the opportunity and the economic growth to deal with our budgetary problems. We must get our national finances in order. The time has come to balance the federal budget and to free our children from the burdens upon their prosperity and their lives. This is a congressional voting card. This card goes into a box on the House floor and the computer records the members vote. The congressional voting card is the most expensive credit card in the world. For two generations, it has been used to pile up trillions in debt that our children and our grandchildren will eventually have to repay. Now, a big debt has a big impact. To make such numbers real, let me give you an example. If you have a child or a grandchild born this year, that child is going to pay $187,000 in taxes in their lifetime to pay their share of the interest on the debt. Yes, you heard me right. $187,000 in taxes in their lifetime. That's over $3,500 in taxes every year of their working lives, not to pay the debt, just to pay interest on the debt we are leaving them. That's before their tax to pay for Social Security or Medicare, education or highways, police or national defense. You know and I know that's just not fair to our children. It was once an American tradition to pay off the mortgage and leave the children the farm. Now we seem to be selling the farm and leaving our children the mortgage. By 1997, we will pay more for interest on the debt than for the national defense. That's right. More of our tax money will be spent to pay interest on government bonds than will pay for the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the intelligence agencies, and the defense bureaucracy combined. Okay, let's go beyond interest on the debt and discuss Social Security. I want to reassure all of you who are on Social Security or who will soon retire that your Social Security is fine. No one will touch your Social Security, period. But we must make sure that the baby boomers' retirements, which are coming up in the next century, are as secure as their parents. Unfortunately, the money the government supposedly has been putting aside for the baby boomers' Social Security is not there. The government has been borrowing that money to pay for the budget deficit. So when the baby boomers get set to retire, where's the money to pay them going to come from? Well, you might ask. Can't the government just borrow more money? The honest answer is no. No system, no country is wealthy enough to have unlimited borrowing. The answer is clear. The key to protecting the baby boomer's Social Security is to balance the budget. That way, by the time the baby boomers retire, the government will be financially sound. It'll have the money to pay them. The problem is not Social Security, after all. Social Security would be fine if the federal government would stop borrowing the money. The government can stop borrowing the money when we balance the budget. It is just that simple. Our goals are simple. We don't want our children to drown in debt. We want baby boomers to be able to retire with the same security as their parents. We want our senior Americans to be able to rely on Medicare without fear. 
These are the reasons why, as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, our generation has a rendezvous with destiny. This is the year we rendezvous with our destiny to establish a clear plan to balance the budget. It can no longer be put off. That's why I'm speaking to you so frankly. Next month, we will propose a budget that is balanced over seven years. The budget can be balanced even with the problems of the federal government. It can be balanced without touching a penny of Social Security and without raising taxes. In fact, spending overall can go up every year. We simply have to limit annual spending increases to about 3% between now and 2002. The key is the willingness to change, to set priorities, to redesign the government, to recognize that this is not the 60s or the 70s, this is the 1990s, and we need a government to match the times. As I've said, Social Security is off the table. But you know, that leaves a lot on the table. Corporate welfare, subsidies of every special interest, defense is on the table. I'm a hawk, but I'm a cheap hawk. As the budget battle rages over the coming months, you'll hear screams from the special interest groups. I'm sure you've already heard the dire cries that we're going to take food out of the mouths of school children, that we're going to feed them ketchup. The fact of the matter is, all we did was vote to increase school lunch 4.5% every year for five years and give the money to the states to spend because we thought they would do a better job than the federal government of managing the children's meals and the school lunch program. You see, we believe if local parents, local school boards, and local state legislators visit their children's local schools, they will know firsthand about their children's lunches. Our critics, however, believe that if the school hires a clerk who doesn't cook anything to fill out a report to go to the state clerk who doesn't cook anything, but fills out a report so that the national clerk in Washington, who doesn't cook anything, can write you a letter about the school they didn't visit in the county they've never been to to reassure you about the lunch they've never seen. Now that's the difference in our two approaches. All I ask is that as we work to balance the budget, when you hear these arguments, you verify the facts on both sides, and then you decide which approach is best. Whatever the arguments, this remains a country of unparalleled possibilities. I was talking the other day to a fellow who does business in Europe. He said, what impresses people overseas is that Americans can change faster than anybody. That's why we're competitive once again in the world. We as a people have the natural ability to respond to change. That is what we do best when the government is not in the way. Our potential is as great and prosperous as it's ever been in our history. From now on, all roads lead forward. This job can't be done in Washington. We need your participation in a new dialogue. I hope every high school and college student will spend some class time in April or early May looking at the impact of the debt on their young lives. We are making this speech and our briefing on the budget available through the Library of Congress at Thomas on the internet. Both are also available from your congressman or your congresswoman's office. We want every American to have the facts and to participate in the new dialogue. If I had one message for this country on this day when we celebrate the act of keeping our word, it would be a simple message. Idealism is American. To be romantic is American. It's okay to be a skeptic, but don't be a cynic. It's okay to raise good questions, but don't assume the worst. It's okay to report difficulties, but it's equally good to report victories. Yes, we have problems, and of course it's going to be difficult to enact these things. That's the American way. And of course we're going to have to work hard. And of course we're going to have to negotiate with the president. And of course the American people are going to have to let their will be known. But why should we be afraid of that? That is freedom. I'm here tonight to say that we're going to open a dialogue because we want to create a new partnership with the American people. A plan to remake the government and balance the budget that is the American people's plan. Not the House Republican plan, not the Gingrich plan, but the plan of the American people. And it is in that spirit of committing ourselves idealistically, committing ourselves romantically, believing in America, that we celebrate having kept our word. And we promise to begin a new partnership so that together we and all of the American people can give our children and our country a new birth of freedom. Thank you and good night.
Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich about three hours ago across the river at Long Branch Elementary School and Park in Arlington, Virginia. The Democratic response by Senator Tom Daschle of South Dakota and first, Congressman Dick Gephardt, the House Democratic leader, Democrat from Missouri. Good evening. I'm Dick Gephardt. I'm speaking to you tonight from Long Branch Elementary School in Arlington, Virginia. And to me, there's no better place to talk about the first 100 days of the Republican Congress. Because while the Republicans are celebrating the end of their contract with America, for the children here at Long Branch, the contract is only just beginning. Next year, there are children here who won't have school lunches. The Republicans cut them to pay for tax breaks for the wealthiest Americans. Next summer, there are children all across America who won't have summer jobs because the Republicans wiped out the whole program. They abolished jobs for kids. At the same time, they were abolishing all the income taxes for some of the largest and wealthiest corporations. And unless we reverse the policy of these hundred days, when it comes time for students here to go to college, many of them, and many of your children, will find the door slammed in their face. The Republicans in the House want to cut student loans for millions of young men and women from middle-class families. The Republicans have even tried to classify school lunches and college loans as welfare. How dare they? Those are the programs that work for people who are working hard. Is this what you voted for last November? The wrong kind of budget cuts that will hurt your families in order to pay for the wrong kind of tax cuts that will help the few? Under the Republican capital gains tax cut, if you earn $350,000 a year, you'll reap a $13,000 tax reduction. But if you earn $30,000 a year, you'll just get 50 cents a week. Speaker Gingrich says this tax cut is the crown jewel of the Republican agenda. I think that's the right phrase for it, because it goes mostly to the most privileged Americans. But don't take it from me. Take it from today's Wall Street Journal, which announced in a headline, and I quote, that this tax bill could mean a windfall for the well-off. And they go on to tell their readers, don't do anything yet, but start salivating. We've seen a hundred days of tax cuts for the wealthy and budget cuts for the middle class. Of course, there's been some progress. Republicans and Democrats have joined together to make honest changes in the way we do the public's business. We stood together to make sure the laws Congress applies to you are also applied to the Congress. We voted together for the line item veto so a president can cut spending by literally crossing it out of the budget line by line. We will work with Republicans wherever we can, but we cannot agree to policies that hurt the middle class and working families who need someone to stand up and fight for them. For more than a decade and a half, wages and income have declined for all but the wealthiest Americans. You've had to work longer and harder just to keep from falling behind. How can you raise a strong family when you're working day and night and barely have time to spend with your children? What matters is not the bills the Republicans have passed, but the bills you have to pay. The truth is, nothing in these hundred days addresses the fundamental challenge of an America that has fallen to seventh in the world in standard of living. Never has so much been done in so little time to help so few at the expense of so many. The speaker's rhetoric cannot conceal the reality. Franklin Roosevelt's hundred days were for the people. These hundred days have been for the privileged. So now that the headlines have been written and the bows have been taken, let's get down to the real work of changing this nation. Let's sit down. Republicans and Democrats together and do something about jobs and income, health care and education. 
Let's worry about the hardworking majority of our people and not try to trick you into supporting legislation that just lavishes more on those who have the most. Let's recognize that if we don't begin to protect, preserve, and defend the middle class, we may not have one in 20 years. If you ask me, that's a fight worth making. We can start with health care. Just because it became a problem for the politicians doesn't mean it stopped being a problem for you. Tonight, I asked Speaker Gingrich to sit down with me in the days ahead on a bipartisan basis to negotiate a solution to America's health care crisis. We can do it step by step, but let's take the first step now and let's do it together. Then let's move on to strengthen education, not cut it, to fight for America's standard of living, not wring our hands while it erodes. Let's raise the minimum wage to make it a living wage. Let's encourage corporations to put a little more money in the pockets of workers who are more productive, and not just a lot more money, partisan basis, to negotiate a solution to America's health care crisis. We can do it step by step, but let's take the first step now, and let's do it together. Then let's move on to strengthen education, not cut it, to fight for America's standard of living, not wring our hands while it erodes. Let's raise the minimum wage to make it a living wage. Let's encourage corporations to put a little more money in the pockets of workers who are more productive, and not just a lot more money in the bank accounts of a few executives who don't deserve to reap all the rewards. We as Democrats are ready, and I know the President is ready, to work with the Republicans and do the real work of change. And let's measure our success, not by bills passed or popularity scores or a checklist of contract clauses, but by a more fundamental test. Let's ask what every decision means to the children here at Long Branch and to the families who send them to school each day, families who work and save and hope for their future. That should be our new bipartisan contract with America. Now let me turn this over to my friend Tom Daschle, our Senate Democratic leader. Thanks, Dick. The question before us at the end of these hundred days isn't who stands for change. Clearly both parties do. The issue is what kind of change is it going to be? In these past 100 days, Democrats and Republicans have joined together to make changes in how the government works. Where we have divided, and sharply, is over the question of who the government should be working for. On that question, day after day, the differences between the two parties have become clearer and clearer. While claiming to place government on the side of working Americans, over the past 100 days, the Republicans have shown their true loyalties to the forces of privilege and power who need no help and deserve no special favors. We all know that we can never balance the federal budget, create new jobs, raise our standard of living without attacking obsolete and wasteful government spending. But that's not what the Republicans in Congress have been doing. Instead, they've hammered programs that provide opportunities for our children, school lunches, college scholarships, educational reform, student loans, while sparing and even increasing government subsidies and tax breaks for the very wealthy and the largest corporations. And for all the tough talk at the end of these hundred days, none of the cutting that has been done by the Republican Congress has moved us to a balanced federal budget, not even close. Instead, the Republicans have passed bills to slash taxes for the rich, and allow many large corporations to stop paying income taxes altogether. They bow to special interest demands that weaken the laws and protect our health and safety. They have given lobbyists unprecedented access and influence. No wonder the legislation emerging from the Republican Congress favors powerful interests. Their lobbyists are actually sitting in the committee rooms writing it. There have been changes, all right, but by and large, it isn't the change 
you voted for. Instead, it is America's middle-class families that are getting shortchanged again. What the Republican Congress has produced is not a, a contract with America, but a plan that's lost contact with the real America, with middle-class families who are struggling harder and harder to stay even, and even who have less and less time to spend with their kids. Democrats want to work with Republicans where we can, but most of all, we are committed to standing on your side. So when Republicans pick the powerful and special interests over you, we're going to fight them every step of the way. And it isn't just Democrats who are troubled by this. Many of Speaker Gingrich's ideas are so extreme, so unfair, so wrong, that even Republicans in the Senate will refuse to pass them. When Republicans tried to stop new health and safety rules, rules to set safety standards for mammograms and drinking water, the Senate said no. The Senate has rejected House Republican cuts in education programs, and many Senate Republicans have joined Democrats in questioning Speaker Gingrich's tax plan. And I believe that Democrats will have Republican help in rejecting his proposals to eliminate 100,000 new police and to end college scholarships for young people ready to serve their countries. In these hundred days, the House has passed many bills. But as Dick said, nothing, nothing has been done to help you pay your bills, the bills you pay each month, your credit cards, your mortgage, your car and loan payments. In the next hundred days, we ask Republicans to work with us to change this country and make government work for you. Tonight, we call on Republicans to join us in at least three specific challenges in the days ahead. First, let's work together to make health insurance affordable and available to all Americans. And let's make sure a family doesn't lose its coverage when parents change jobs or find themselves out of work. Second, let's make work uh, in, in, in coming together uh, in, in reducing college costs and making them more affordable. Let's expand opportunities, not shrink them. For parents who are trying to send their kids to school and for adults who are trying on top of everything else to go back to school and improve their skills. And third, let's, let's pass a plan that replaces the current welfare system. One that helps people work their way out of poverty without punishing young children. That was President Clinton's goal in 1992, and the time for Congress to act is now. We're ready to sit down with Republican leaders right away to begin working on these priorities. I believe that if Republicans and Democrats do what is right for you, we can make the second hundred days truly historic, a time when we can finally begin to make this a government both of and for the people. That would be a real cause for celebration, not for politicians and their campaign strategists or for lobbyists who are cashing in their IOUs, but for hardworking middle-class families. They are the true strength of this nation and our real purpose for being here. Thank you and good night. Senator Tom Daschle from South Dakota and Congressman Dick Gephardt, the House Democratic leader from Missouri, giving the Democratic response to the address delivered earlier this evening by Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, the first time ever a speaker has delivered a uh, speech before a national audience during a primetime address. Our phone lines and fax lines are open for the next 20 minutes. We will then show you at midnight Eastern time, 9 o'clock for those of you in the West Coast, a speech earlier today by President Clinton. He traveled to Dallas. He is in California this evening. We'll spend part of the weekend uh, on the West Coast, coming back to Washington on Sunday evening. And in Dallas today, he delivered a speech before the American Society of Newspaper Editors. He spoke for about 45 minutes. This is the Speaker of the House earlier this evening here in Washington. Good evening. I want to thank you for joining me tonight and for this chance to give you, the American people, a report on the new Congress, what we've been doing, what we hope to do, and how we're working to keep faith with what you sent us here to do. But first, let me thank the hundreds of thousands of Americans who've written me over the past few months. Your letters, nearly 400,000, are full of good ideas and often moving words of encouragement. This letter, addressed to Dear Mr. Newt, included a portrait of George Washington. It was sent to me by first grader Stephen Frankowiak from Georgia, 
And I thank Stephen and everyone else. If you live on the West Coast, and you may have been working when uh, Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich delivered his remarks, which would have been at 5 o'clock e West Coast time, and so we will re-air throughout the evening the events of the day, including the Speaker's remarks, uh, which took place from S230 in the uh, U.S. Capitol, the Speaker's office, and we'll follow that at 11.30 Eastern time, 8.30 for those of you in the West Coast, with the Democratic response by Congressman Dick Gephardt and Senator Daschle of South Dakota. And then another chance for you to phone in with your comments during an open phone segment for about 20 minutes. And then at midnight here in the East Coast, 9 o'clock West Coast time, we will show you the President's remarks from Dallas, Texas, at the American Society of Newspaper Editors Association as he spoke to them and took some questions from the newspaper editors. But for 100 days can't overturn the ne neglect of decades. The contract's purpose has been to show that change is possible that even in Washington, you can do what you say you're going to do. In short, we wanted to prove to you, and I think to us, that democracy still has the vitality and the will to do something about the problems facing our nation. And it seems to me that whether you're a conservative or a liberal, that is a very positive thing. And so I want to talk about the contract tonight, our successes and our failures, but I also want to talk about something much larger. Because although I've spent the last six months of my life living and breathing and fighting for what's written in this contract, I know the American people want more than these ten items. Who wrote me, even if you didn't include a picture of George Washington. Last September, the House Republicans signed a contract with America. We signed this contract and made some promises to you and to ourselves. You elected us, and for the last 93 days, we have been keeping our word. With your help, we're bringing about real change. We made Congress subject to the same laws as everyone else. We cut congressional committee staffs and budgets by 30%, and we voted on every item in the contract. And I can tell you tonight, we're going to sell one congressional building and privatize at least one congressional parking lot. While we've done a lot, this contract has never been about curing all the ills of the nation. So what I want to talk with you about tonight is not just what a new political majority on Capitol Hill has accomplished in 100 days, but how all of us together, Republicans and Democrats alike, must totally remake the federal government to change the very way it thinks, the way it does business, the way it treats its citizens. After all, the purpose of changing government is to improve the lives of our citizens, to strengthen the future of our children, to make our neighborhoods safe, and to build a better country. Government is not the end, it is the means. We Americans wake up every morning, go to work, take our kids to school, fix dinner, do all the things we expect of ourselves, and yet something isn't quite right. 